इस महीने की बुक रिव्यू में मैं खुद बुक रिव्यू नहीं करूंगा बल्कि ऑथर के साथ एक कॉन्वर्सेशन में होगा हर महीने में एक बुक रिव्यू करता हूं विच इज वन ऑफ माई फेवरेट बुक्स एंड दिस मंथ बुक इज द डिफाइनिंग डेकेट एक ऐसी किताब जो हर एक ट्वेंटी ईयर ओल्ड को पढ़नी चाहिए इस बुक में डॉक्टर मैग जे हु इज द ऑथर ऑफ द बुक ने ये बताया है कि कैसे ये ट्वेंटीज का जो डेकेट है वो आपकी जिंदगी के लिए कितना जरूरी है और कैसे आप इस डेकेट में अपनी जिंदगी बदल सकते हैं दिस बुक रिव्यू सीरीज इज ब्रॉट टू यू बाई कुको एफ एम विच इज इंडिया बिगेस्ट ऑडियो व नैकुलर प्लेटफॉर्म जहां आपकी फेवरेट किताबें आपकी चुनिंदा भाषा में आप सुन सकते हैं टू गेट फिफ्टी परसेंट ऑफ ऑन द कुको एफ एम सब्सक्रिप्शन आप पिन कॉमेंट और डिस्क्रिप्शन में मेरा कोड यूज कर सकते हैं एंड हियर योर फेवरेट बुक्स इन योर फेवरेट लैंग्वेज ये है मेरी कॉन्वर्सेशन विद डॉक्टर मैग जे बहुत ही खूबसूरत and i hope you enjoy it thank you so much meg for joining us it's such a pleasure to have you on my platform to spend time with you i'm so happy to be here thanks for having me wonderful i have to admit uh me and my community we're big fans of the book that you've written the defining decade uh, it's something that i've actively spoken about the last several years of creating content uh, so it's it's a pleasure to have you in person speak in depth about the book i uh I first had a very honest question to to ask, which is: I've seen your TED talk. It starts with the journey of you uh, with Alex as your first client, and then figuring, hey, thirty right. is Good not memory. the new twenty. Yes. Yeah. So, what, what was the book in some way a reflection of how your twenties were, or was that a very dispassionate third party observation of how twenty should be? Uh, definitely both. Um, I write nonfiction, but it's hard. to write non-fiction with a voice you know if you don't have yourself in there and so when i started working with 20 somethings i had just turned well i was 29 just about to turn 30 and i remember when i turned 30 i thought i can do this i'm 30 i just felt like i had this instant authority somehow it's and you know it is great to get out of your 20s in a lot of ways um but you know i'm a gen uh, gen xer so you know we were really the first generation to kind of hit a lot of those adult milestones later and that has its upsides and its downsides and so part of what i was talking about in the book is you know what are some of the upsides and the downsides of how you figure out the timing um and what are some of the myths that seemed like what could go wrong for the gen xers but now that we've you know it's millennials and gen zers we're saying you know well, maybe there's some other things to think about rather than everything can happen later so it was definitely both I and mean, it was not just a memoir i mean i've seen thousands of 20 somethings and so it, you know the courage of my convictions came from their lives really maybe more than mine got it and and and, and if i were to ask you uh objectively how much of that book was something that actually was the way you conducted your 20 like if i if if i were to set you up for an examination and say hey what percentage of your 20s was the defining decade playbook <laughs> would you want to hazard a guess uh i mean i was a 20s i mean you know i i think it's tough to be a 21st century 20 something and not feel like i've lived all those chapters and you know i'm some of my moves were smarter than others um there are some things i would do differently and some things i managed to do you know quote right the first time um so there wasn't a single chapter in there that i felt like i've heard about this but i can't relate i mean i've lived it too but really it's it is you know pattern recognition talking to people and you hear something over and over and then you think okay this is important not just because it happened to me but because there are all these other people who were saying i'm having a hard time and i want to talk about this that's really sort of what gets me on my soapbox more than like my my life i think as a 20 something i probably assumed who would care about my life but by the time i was in my 30s and i'd listened to so many 20 somethings i thought this is really something to care about this is important Yeah. No, I I I love that. The the one challenge that I I face and I don't know if you I, I'm sure you you encounter that quite often is when someone goes out and says, "Hey, don't think of your 30s as as the new 20s. The 20s is the defining decade. You need to take ownership. You need to take charge." It tends to alienate those already in their 30s and 40s and beyond, and they suddenly feel like, "Oh my god, is, is this like a all lost on us and we can't do anything about it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, well, what's been the way that you counter that? 
Yeah. Well, you know, I did. And I, I wrote the update, you know, for the 10th anniversary edition. And I, I, you know, was maybe a little bit more clear that life is not over at 30. That wasn't the point. Um, it was really, hey, this is my best advice about adult development. It all applies. It's going to apply to your job when you're 40. It's going to apply if you're trying to get married for the second time in your 50s. Um, but I just am a person who I like to get it, the message out as soon as possible. But, you know, it's interesting, you know, individual differences. People will write me and they'll say, I'm 29. There's nothing I can do. It's too late. I couldn't possibly change now. And then I'll get an email from someone who's 41 that said, I read your book. It totally changed my life. So, you know, I think it also says something about the individual, about whether or not they feel like, well, I guess, you know, I don't have to do any of this stuff now because I'm over 30 or I can't versus, yeah. you know, I get it. Life isn't that black and white. <laughs> I, I get it. Well, what, what, what do you, you know, as, as, as someone who's, of course, academically and professionally qualified to, to have this observation Nothing of what you've said in the book is is rocket science, if you'll oh, forgive me for, sure. for stating yeah, yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. But there's still so much inertia in people to go ahead and, and first believe in it and then to act upon it. Uh, and it fascinates me. People are willing to give up years and years and time of just procrastination and, and making excuses as against taking charge and, and doing something about it. Do, do you have... Anything that suggests why does it happen? Like, is it is it behavioral? Is it is it environment? Is it just the way that the conditioning, the education system is training us all? Like, what could be leading to this lack of action from? Yeah, from those? I mean, there are a lot of factors, but you know, to back up to it's not rocket science. I totally agree. But what I love about working with young adults is it you know, sort of the, the the art and the science of being an adult is new to young adults. Like it's not rocket science, maybe to me and you at this point, but to someone who's 22, like they really never thought about this before. Like, how do I take ownership of my career or how do I, you know, go about finding a partner if that's what I want? And so it's interesting that no matter how many years I've been doing this, which is, you know, go 20-ish now, teaching, working with 20-somethings, there's a new crop every single year who have heard all this for the or hearing all this for the first time, and it does it is rocket science to them. And I mean that in like a really amazing, wonderful, super fun way, where it's like this is super helpful because they haven't read the New York Times article from five years ago that everyone else read. So, um, so there's that piece. I just think that um, you know, to be a young adult in the 21st century the amount of uncertainty and the sort of do it yourselfing that needs to go on is so overwhelming that people become you know really stuck and they're not sure whether they should start they they hear that maybe they don't need to start and you know human nature we all sort of secretly wish that maybe somebody's going to do it for us that it will all become clear outside of us. And, you know, then at some point we realize, you know, actually you kind of need to decide your own life or somebody is going to decide it for you. So, um, I mean, I think it's very overwhelming to be, you know, in your twenties right now, there's just a ton of uncertainty and it's, you know, a great time, but also a really difficult time. That's why I have so many clients. It's hard. And I, I, I couldn't agree more with you. I, I think this this age of abundance is, is both an opportunity and a curse because mm -hmm. you it tends to make you gravitate even more towards conventional choices and the and the walked path because you find a sense of security amongst all the chaos and abundance that that you feel and experience right. outside. Uh, wonderful. I I have to congratulate you on on the wonderful articulation of this term identity capital. Like it, it, when I read that, when I heard that. It was. It just landed so well because it just made everything super clear in in just these two words, adding value to who you are, just essentially right. discovering yourself. Um, and you also made it a point, particularly in the TED talk, to say that not every exploration is the right one because there are some right. that take you in the right direction, but some that don't. Um, I I wanted to get your opinion on something which is uh, slightly different from. Well, I shouldn't say slightly fundamentally different from the, the, the U.S. cultural context. Uh, while in the U.S., a lot of the 20-year-olds 
I said, hey, you still have time. 30 is a new 20. You don't have to figure things out. You can take these 10 years to figure. In the Indian cultural context, it's quite the opposite, where there is intense pressure to settle down as soon as you can in life, Mm -hmm. to to quickly get an education, to quickly get a job, to quickly get married, to quickly have kids, to quickly buy that house, that car, and whatnot. So when I spend time with, with kids, they're like, I don't have time to explore. I don't have time to build this capital because I need to finish everything that is a milestone set by society. Um, I, I'd love to get your opinion on it as, as someone who, who came up with this idea and then, of course, have suggested others to follow. Yeah, I, you know, it's, I get a lot of emails from India and I actually really love it. They're always like just really lovely emails from very thoughtful people. So, um, you know, I, I'm a, I'm, I get the struggle of on the one end of the spectrum, you've got the, you have infinite time and then another end of the spectrum, which is obvious, often, you know, sort of culturally influenced there. It's, if you haven't figured it all out by 22, you're a failure or that's what parents think. Um, you know, I think identity capital is a great, concept for people to be able to be in the middle somewhere where you don't have to make one choice that then you're going to do for 50 years and that you can be exploring, but adding value to yourself while you're exploring. So, you know, explorations that don't add value in some way, I don't, I mean, you'd have to really convince me (laughs) as to what you're actually exploring or what is the value of that. But, you know, exploration that adds value to who you are, I think can feel like exploration and progress at the same time. And so, you know, some of my clients here who are from the U.S., but maybe their, you know, parents were raised elsewhere, that's sort of where they can meet in the middle on, okay, I understand, you know, you're not going to have your lifelong career and your lifelong partner at 22. You're going to explore, but you're not just going to do nothing or waste your time or procrastinate. You're out there you know, building skills, figuring out and building who you are that, you know, your learning curve in your 20s is really your earning curve in your 30s and beyond. And I mean, earning in every way, not just financially, but just in terms of confidence and competence and emotional stability. So, you know, I think getting out there and learning and exploring in a way that's adding richness is what, you know, would be my hope for 20-somethings everywhere. And I think you can do that without you know, terrifying your parents or um, blowing your life. <laughs> Wonderful. No, that that's that's very sound advice. I um, I then go on to the to the next part of uh, the key lesson that that you shared, which was uh, leveraging your your weak connects or your weak orbit. Mm-hmm. Essentially, just building your tribe outside of the immediate tribe you have. Right. Now, I've been for the longest time a very strong proponent of uh, cold emailing, cold messaging, yeah. just reaching out yeah. to people, asking. Yeah. And right. uh, I have a life philosophy that says, if you don't ask, the answer is always no. So please <laughs> ask. The rebuttal that I often get is, it doesn't always work in the corporate world. While it's, it's, it's nice and fashionable in the startup community, you can reach out to the founders, they're all pretty much the same age. But I can't, Cold email, Google, Facebook, Amazon. I can't cold email General Electric. I can't cold email my way through becoming a, a, a lawyer or a psychologist or so on. Um, and I frankly, I'm not an expert to answer those questions, but would you have an opinion on when you think about leveraging your weak tribe, does it have limitations or is it infinite in its possibilities? Um, I think it's infinite in its possibilities because you can't really see, you know, your, your, your weak ties to everyone you've ever met and everyone they've ever met and everyone they've ever met. So, I mean, you really can't see where all this might lead. Now, that doesn't mean that I can email, you know, uh, Elon Musk and then he's going to make me, you know, the, the CEO of Tesla or Twitter if that goes through. Who knows? It's not like that. But that may mean I have a friend of a friend of a friend who works at Tesla and I'm going to reach out there and that person's going to help my resume get seen. And, you know, and and maybe that works out and maybe it doesn't, but it only needs to work out one time for me to get my, you know, one good piece of identity capital. And so, you know, I, 
I am hard pressed to think of situations where people got something, apartments, dates, ideas, you know, job interviews where somehow the weak tie wasn't involved. And what I think is really the reason I wanted to put that chapter, I put identity capital and weak ties in there first thing, because I know my audience And if they didn't get further than 30 pages before they put the book down, I wanted them to get that because those are my two best pieces of advice in terms of really transforming your life. I mean, like really changing it on a dime. Um, But, you know, it's what I thought was important about weak ties is for young adults to really understand that what I'm talking about is not nepotism. Um, Because some of that, I thought you're going to say the pushback is sometimes like, well, that's nepotism. That's gross. I don't want to do that. But it's actually, I'm not talking about nepotism. I'm talking more about crowdsourcing of, you know, not, you know, my rich uncle giving me something I don't deserve as much as just really having a problem. I need an apartment. I need a new job, putting it out to the crowd. And, you know, kind of seeing who can move the peanut a little bit at a time. And that's usually how it works. Yeah. I, 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 I want to stress upon the point that you make, you only need it to work once. Just you once. don't have to have a 100% yeah. hit rate. Right. You have a 1% hit rate. If you make enough of those, if you, like you said, if you ask enough people, 1% will do. Um, you just need one for the, the job interview that gets you that piece of identity capital that opens up new weak ties and gives you more value. So the next job is easier. So, I mean, it all builds. It's not like you're sort of stuck with this one little network. You're trying to work forever. Yeah. Yeah. No, that, that that's always very reassuring for, for people when they hear that. Um, and that brings us to the, to the third point, which is uh, pick your family. And, yeah. and I found that lovely because uh, I, I do believe the family you're born into and the family that you pick for yourself eventually uh, goes on to define a lot of your life in, in the way that you think about things, in the way that it just unfolds for you. Um, again, the cultural difference, though it's changing, is the U.S. is almost 100% of love marriages, high divorce rates, and then remarriaging and so on. While India is still largely this concept of arranged marriages where your parents are picking up your life partner, um, very low divorce rates. That doesn't mean happy marriages. It just means that (laughs) there is social taboo in going through that. So, So when you think of the cultural context of India, and you still, I strongly believe, uh, would want to endorse picking your family and going about the right way. Uh, what, what would be your suggestions for, for youngsters, young adults in, in the, this kind of a context or cultural situation? Right. Well, I, again, I'm, I'm thinking of clients I've had here who are, you know, growing up in the U.S., but maybe their parents were from India and they're, they're trying to they're trying to do that of, you know, the intersection of the two cultures of, I see all my American friends that are, are heard, you know, don't get married before you're 30. And I mean, I have no date on this. This is an individual thing, but you know, they hear just date forever and eventually it'll happen. And then their parents are saying, no, 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 you know, we've got somebody we want you to meet. And so, you know, I think there's probably some wisdom in, in both models. I mean, there are things to take. I mean, I, I, I can only imagine that people who've been married know a thing or two about being married and picking out a partner, you know, to go the distance with. Um, maybe sometimes in ways that our friends, you know, can't see into the future of like what marriage is really like. Um, but also, you know, I think these days and 21st century young adults like to feel like that they really owned their own partnership, that they really picked it. They really chose it. And so, you know, the idea of picking your family, you know, it came from the saying, you know, people say, well, you can't pick your family, but you can pick your friends. And obviously you do do pick your family, you know, when you settle down with someone, it's typically the most important decision you'll ever make because many people want to make it just one time. So it's a big one. So the picking your family is really about just be as intentional as you can about the process. That doesn't mean, well, I pick it and my, you know, the wisdom of my elders can't be considered. It just means being intentional about what is likely going to be the biggest decision you'll ever make. Makes sense. Makes a lot of sense. Um, One final question before we wind up, Meg. After almost a decade of of writing the book, uh, millions of people reaching out for for feedback, 
Um, is there anything in the book that you you wish you could correct or you feel has changed over the years that's perhaps come out in the in the 10th anniversary edition yeah, that yeah. we haven't had? Yeah. Um, you know, I think what the 10th anniversary edition, what it has, I mean, I don't, I shouldn't like be pushing it if y'all can't get your hands on it, but maybe you will be able to soon, but it has a reader's guide in the back because a lot of people said, oh, I want to, you know, this is a big book club book. Um, and so I want to be able to like have questions and really workshop this with my friends or my book club. So I added that I did a lot more on social media and full circle to maybe what was your first question. I definitely highlighted more of life isn't over at your th- when you're 30, that if you're picking this book up at 32, it's still for you. And sometimes that urgency around like, oh my gosh, you know, I, I need to do this yesterday. You would be surprised how quickly things could change. I mean, some 20 year olds pick up the book and they're like, yeah, she's probably right, but I've got 10 years to work this out. Um, whereas a 32 year old can pick it up and say, oh my gosh. I need to do this yesterday, so I'm going to do it now. And, you know, I think that's great. Fantastic. I, I, I really hope that we can get to lay our hands on the 10th anniversary edition as, as soon as it's available in the country. Thank you so much for oh, sparing pleasure. your time this morning. I enjoyed it. Thank you for having me. Thank you. It's always a pleasure. Thanks for sharing your art, for your work, and a uh, big fan. And I'm sure my community is going to love this conversation. Thanks, Meg. I hope you enjoyed this conversation just as much as I did. बहुत मजा आया डॉक्टर मैग जे के साथ बैठकर ये समझने का कि US context और Indian context में कैसे similarities हैं despite the differences जो हम जानते हैं. Please pick this book up. बहुत ही transformational book है, बहुत ही खूबसूरत book है. डॉक्टर जे का एक TED talk भी है, which is 30s are not the new 20s, which I would strongly recommend. वो भी pin comment और description में आपके लिए है. This is Ankur Varikho signing off. YouTube Shorts के लिए एक डेडिकेटेड चैनल लॉन्च किया गया है जिसपे आप सिर्फ वो 60 सेकंड के शॉर्ट्स देख सकते हैं नो लॉन्ग फॉर्मेट कंटेंट टू कंफ्यूज यू एंड होपफुली दो 60 सेकंड्स विल हेल्प यू जस्ट एज मच एज दीज लॉन्ग फॉर्मेट वीडियोस डू सब्सक्राइब करिए पिन कमेंट और डिस्क्रिप्शन में लिंक है टू द वारिकू शॉर्ट्स चैनल